Welcome back to the Student Hub Live STEM Showcase. In this session, we uh, introduce you to some of our researchers. And I'm joined by Chris Heath, who is a lecturer um, in health sciences and specialises in neurobiology. Chris, you're doing some incredibly exciting work right now that has some real practical applications. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what you've got uh, in store to talk to us about. You'll see um, our interactive voting tools at home as well. So if you let us know where you are, how you're feeling right now, um, which areas you're studying and also which level you're studying, just click on the button that applies to you. And when you're telling us how you're feeling, you need three words to be able to submit your answers. If you can't think of three, that's absolutely fine. Just put a full stop and your results will submit. We have Jason and Sultana in the studio who are on our hot desk. Hello, both. Hello. Hello there, guys. How's everyone back at home? Good, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> good, good, excellent. So, Chris, tell us a bit about your research. Yes, Karen. Well, thanks for having me on, first of all. Um, so my research is all about working out what goes on in the around one and a half kilos of biological tissue that we all carry around with us in our skulls. Easy peasy. Absolutely. Very straightforward. <laughs> um, what I'm particularly interested in is just understanding how that piece of tissue allows us to be the people that we all are and has allowed us to accomplish the many things that humankind has done, taking people to the moon, painting the Mona Lisa, writing Romeo and Juliet, but also the more mundane things. So deciding whether I want Marmite or strawberry jam on my toast this morning, remembering that I need to book half a day's leave to take the dog to the vet in two weeks, things like this. But oh, recently my work has focused really on trying to address how we deal with two quite simple questions. How are you doing and how are you feeling? And the reason I'm interested in those questions is because if we imagine that we're flies on the wall in a, a documentary um, on a in a hospital, for example, in a conversation between a doctor and a patient, those two questions are going to come up. Now, if the patient is there because they've got a physical injury, so for example, right now in the, in the nice weather, I was on the beach with my kids and I accidentally fell into one of the holes that they dug in the sand. Yes. And I went home, but now unfortunately I can't walk very well because my right leg really, really hurts. So the doctor has an idea of causation, so they know that they fell in the hole. They have an idea of where the injury is because they're reporting pain in a specific part of their body. And they have an idea of what they can do, so they can examine the leg, or they can perhaps send the patient for an x-ray. And because we know what the bone structure should look like, we can compare it to what the patient now has and say, unfortunately, you've broken your ankle, you're going to need surgery. Similarly, we could have a situation where a patient comes in and says, I don't know what's wrong with me, doctor, I have a headache. I'm quite breathless when I walk up and downstairs and I can't really do my you know, morning jog anymore. So the first thing the doctor is gonna do is reach for his trusty blood pressure cuff and he's gonna say, right, I'm just gonna check your blood pressure. And from that blood pressure cuff, he's gonna get two numbers, so 120 over 80 or something like that, a definitive value for blood pressure. That value can then be compared against the history of medicine and we can work out whether that patient's blood pressure is normal, is high or is low. And from that, the doctor can come up with treatment options. Now with mental health, the story is very different. So the patient may come in and say, I'm not really sure what's wrong with me, doctor. I just feel off. Or they might be a little bit more specific. They might say, I keep forgetting where I'm leaving my keys and things like this. So, but the doctor is then gonna say, well, do you have any idea when this started? And unfortunately with a lot of mental health conditions, people live with them for an awfully long time before they're even willing to admit sometimes that they actually have a problem. Mm. Or they come on so slowly and so gradually, it's very hard to actually work out and pinpoint in time when it happened. So consequently, we have an issue of causation. So we don't know what caused the condition and we don't necessarily know how long they've had it for. The other issue is when we ask a question like, how are you feeling? You might reply and say, I'm feeling very well today or I feel good. But as a person listening to you, my definition of good or mm -hmm. feeling well might be completely different to yours. So consequently, it's very hard for me to measure what you mean when you say to me, I feel well or I feel good. Consequently, in mental health terms, it's actually a lot more difficult for us to get a meaningful quantitative value of how somebody feels or indeed how their brain is functioning. Mm. So consequently, what has happened over, the, over time is that in the medical profession, clinicians have developed a huge range of questionnaires and what we would call qualitative instruments where we can learn more about the patient's state by asking them very specific, very defined questions, which are very, very helpful and very, very useful. But what my research has focused on of late is trying to work out ways that we can make that more quantitative. So how can we make assessment of mental health much more like the blood pressure cuff? Can we get a number that tells us how well a person is in terms of, for example, something like attention, yeah. how well their attentional performance is relative to everyone else in the population. And from that number, can we say to an individual, 
it appears you have either hypersensitive attention or perhaps you have an attentional deficit. So maybe you have something like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Mm. And the way we do that is with computerised cognitive, cognitive assessments. Brilliant. And you're going to show us one of these assessments, aren't yes, you? Yes, I am. Um, because one of these tensions, of course, and, and we've been talking about the ways that STEM often links with other areas of, of well, other disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, it's one of these tensions with psychology where yep. the, the science aspect of what you're talking about now is about being, you know, quantitative about what we're actually looking at, how we can, you know, link things to diagnosis, mm -hmm. to treatment, um, and to also measuring, you know, the prevalence, I guess, of some of these conditions within populations and, and you know, looking at the changes over time. Mm -hmm. But equally, something so broad as, you know, how are you feeling needs to be, you know, really narrowed down to something very, very specific, which is what you're doing. And you mentioned attention. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, attention is one of those things that obviously it's important clinically for things that I've said about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but from a pedagogical standpoint, it's also one of these things that's very important for us as teachers and as educators to think about. So how is it that we can develop module materials and course materials that hold our students' attention in such a way that they encode the information that we're giving them saliently enough that they remember it, and then when we ask them to do a TMA, an EMA, or potentially an exam, if they can recall that information accurately so we can give them the marks. So understanding attention and using these assessments to work out how effective a, a measure is at maybe improving attention or even if we want to, turning attention down a little bit depending on, on circumstances mm. is really, really important. And it, it interacts very closely, I would say, hand in hand with our colleagues in psychology because what we're trying to do is work together mm -hmm. to work out a neurological basis for you know, very well-defined psychological constructs that mm. our psychology colleagues think about in a slightly different way. And if we can merge the two schools of thought together, that's very, very powerful. Absolutely. I mean, I've got colleagues in psychology who are looking at, you know, the effect of using mobile phones, for mm -hmm. example, on driving. So a lot of, you know, attention isn't just, you know, located in this area. Absolutely. And, and you know, we don't always notice when things are changing, do we? No, we don't always notice when things are changing. And that, so that's one of the important aspects of attention. So attention can be divided or can be classified in three different ways. So you can have sustained attention, mm. which is the ability to maintain your focus on a given thing for a given period of time, irrespective of what's going on around you. You can have selective attention, which we often define as sort of the spotlight of mm. attention. So you cast your eye around a scene. I mean, as we're you know in World Cup season, if we had the Jules Remey trophy or the World Cup trophy sitting there right now, I'm sure a lot of people's eyes might be distracted towards that, particularly if it has an England flag next to it. <laughs> um, but we don't. <laughs> sadly, we don't. But also, you can also have divided attention, which is something that humans are particularly bad at because we have a limited cognitive capacity for something like that. So that would be, for example, if you have two children in front of you and one of them wants an ice cream and one of them wants to go to the yacht pond or something, trying to deal, trying to get both of those pieces of information in and respond to them in an appropriate way fast enough mm. can be quite challenging. Absolutely. Okay, so are we going to challenge our audience with anything? We're going to try. I mean, what I was thinking is I could show one of the cognitive tasks. Great. Um, as well, and perhaps we can do a little challenge um, associated with the furniture and the arrangements of things in the studio. Okay, excellent idea. Right. So Let's look at the task first. So okay. this is something that you're working on in collaboration with colleagues. Yes, yeah, so, so a, lot, a lot of my work is done in collaboration with big gr research groups elsewhere in the UK and around the world, actually. So we have a, there's a big group at the University of Cambridge, there's a big group at the University of Western Ontario in Canada, and there's another group at Yonsei University in Korea, and also a group at Melbourne in Australia. So there's a big international effort behind this work. Excellent. And what we're doing, so what we have here uh, on the screen is an example of a task that we actually use in our teaching. So mm -hmm. this is on the Open Science Laboratory, which I'm sure a lot of our STEM students are very familiar with. Yeah. Um, and what we have, if I just scroll down to it, what we have is something called the Rapid Visual Processing, or RVP task. Not so, in the popular experiments box, I notice, but, but well, nonetheless, first. <laughs> well, absolutely. So, and it's, curr it's currently used in two of our courses, so in SDK 100, which is our Level 1 Health Science course, mm -hmm. and also SXHL 288, which is our second level Experimental Sciences course. So what we do is I'll just click through on the 288 one, because it's the closest one. Now, I wanted to have a go at this, but for ethical reasons, we're not allowed to yeah. do that. So this, is a, so this is an important issue, and this is an important issue that our students uh, in, in SDK 100 and also in SXHL 208 have to, have to learn about, which is the ethics of human experimentation. Mm. And anything that we do involving a human participant has to be regulated, has to be reviewed by an independent panel of scientists to make sure it's appropriate and make sure there's no risk to either the participant or the experimenter in any way whatsoever, and that can include psychological distress. 
But also we have to be very careful about how we manage data mm -hmm. and also how we protect the identity of our participants, which is also very, very important. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, we can't do the test today live mm -hmm. because um, your, your identity is known. Mm -hmm. So what we would do is once we go through from the Open Science Lab, we can look at the landing page. Then what we would get is we would get a standard page of instructions and all of our participants would have to read that and it tells them about the task, about the function of the task, um, and what they were expected to do. We then click through, mm -hmm. and they will do a brief practice test, which looks like this, hopefully. And essentially, this is what the rapid visual processing task looks like. So it is, in terms of visual stimulation, very, very boring. And that's done deliberately, because we want you to focus your attention on the salient feature, which is the numbers. And the aim of the game here, and the cue, is being given because this is a practice test. So in the actual assessment, you wouldn't get the red numbers or the yellow underline. What we're asking you to do is look for th a string of three odd numbers or a string of three even numbers. Anytime you see one of those strings, you have to press the space bar. If you can sustain your attention for long enough, you will get a higher score. So you will get what we call a high hit rate. So the, number of, the, the maximum number of strings of odds or evens is known to us. And we will know by the number that you report how well, your, how well your attention is functioning. What else we can do is we can look to see how many times you fool yourself. So how many times you think you've seen a string of three when actually you've only seen a string of two or maybe none at all, mm. you may also respond. And that also tells us, gives us a little hint as to whether your attention wandered off for a little bit. Because you may have seen the two numbers and you thought to yourself, it's definitely going to be a nine. But then you actually saw a four. But in your, mi in your mind, you just conflated the two and pressed. Similarly, we also get misses, which mm -hmm. is when there was a string, but you didn't respond whatsoever. And we also get a really useful measure, which is called reaction time. Yeah. So the reaction time measure allows us to know how quickly you press the spacebar after the third digit appeared. Mm. That reaction speed tells us a little bit about the processing speed of your brain, mm. but it also gives us an idea of the sensitivity of your attention. Because mm. the idea would be, if you respond more rapidly, your attention is much more focused and much more switched on, and you're much more likely to press. That's very interesting because often, you know, um, in the days when we had some of the psychology residential schools, we'd all rock up there and then be terribly disappointed when we had to do number tasks, memory <laughs> tasks and things like that. But they are an excellent way of being able to sort of have a level playing field to be able to measure something like this. But it's also got a very practical application because you could measure, you could get a baseline measure, you could measure changes over time and attention, Absolutely. which is why you're linking up with some of the other researchers. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. So the really nice thing about this equipment and, and these sorts of tasks is that they're exactly the same. Yeah. So I can run the task here with you in Milton Keynes. Yeah. A colleague can run it in Korea with Korean, uh, Korean characters, for example. A colleague can run it in Canada. The parameters will be exactly the same, and we can then directly compare the attentional performance of the three people yeah. across the research centres. So it's very powerful, and it allows us to collect together more people in a in one study much more quickly than would be possible at one centre. And you mentioned ADHD earlier. Mm -hmm. So to what extent would this be useful in that sort of situation? It would be useful in the sense that, as it stands, ADHD doesn't have, again, it doesn't have a quantitative numerical diagnostic criterion. Mm. So it, it's useful in the sense that we, you could imagine a situation where you give a patient who, who reports, oh, my attention wanders a little bit, or perhaps a child whose teacher says to their parent, you know, student X just, just doesn't pay attention so much at the, look, when looking at the board, or wriggles around a lot at their desk and just mm. won't sit still mm. and things mm. like this. So those are, again, those are qualitative reports, but you could put the child or the patient in front of one of these and just say, just play this computer game. It'll only take 10 minutes, just have a go. Yeah. And we can then measure that performance, and we can compare it against what we would call a normative sample, which might yeah. be several hundred people that we know don't have an attentional deficit. Yeah. And it would allow us to more definitively diagnose that individual with an attentional problem, and then potentially allow us to, to get in and perform an intervention if possible, either at an earlier stage of the condition, or we can at least start managing that condition more proactively than perhaps we would if it was allowed to go on and on, and perhaps school performance started to suffer, and, and you know the quality of life of the individual was you know, decreased. Brilliant. Thank you. That, that's incredibly great. And now we're going to um, challenge our audience to notice some things. So we're going to make some changes, yes. which is another common thing that uh, psychologists and scientists will do to, to see uh, levels of attention. Absolutely. So while we do that, we're going to take a quick trip to the hot desk and see um, what Jason and Sultana have to say. Hiya. Um, so everyone's just talking about how they're enjoying the weather at the moment um, and with the paddling pool, with their dogs and stuff. So... Everyone's enjoying the weather. Yeah, we have had a question in from a Sarah Green who was struggling with keeping up her attention while she was doing her studies, so I advised her quickly to have a look <clears throat> at her study environment and hopefully make that a bit more 
uh, with less distractions around her and uh, hopefully that's helped her out. But yeah, a lot of people just enjoying the weather and trying to keep out of the sun, I think, when it gets a bit hot. <laughs> No, it is. It's been uh, been very hot out there today, so uh, lovely weather. Yes. Yep. Everyone, definitely. just make sure you top up the suntan <laughs> no lotion <Suntan, laughs> and stay hydrated. Yep. Brilliant. So, Chris, we've changed some things mm -hmm. now in the studio, and let's see uh, if people at home can spot some of the differences. Yep. So have a good look at the set and uh, we've got actually, do you know, we've got some amazing things up here. It's been so interesting thinking about STEM more yeah. broadly and some of the various things and ways that we can represent. There, 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 actually, this is actually going to be quite a challenging task, I think, because there are a huge amount of objects around and they're all actually quite salient. If you're a STEM student, a lot of these things will catch your eye because they'll be quite interesting to you. So, yeah, I'm not sure what we're going to see here, but it'll be interesting. <laughs> Excellent. Now... Why do, why do we do some of these? I mean, some of these, this, this idea actually stems from some very well-known tasks that we weren't allowed to show mm, um, students because of copyright. Um, but, but people do these tasks and actually incredible things happen. Can you tell us very broadly about some of the big experiments that people have done to measure people's attention and how huge they can make some of those changes without people spotting them? Well, so, I mean, there are, there are several classic video experiments that are available online that if you wanted to Google, you could probably find. But so there, there's one example, which is uh, a video of a group of people. I believe they're actually standing in front of a couple of lifts on a landing somewhere in a building. And they're, they're passing a basketball between themselves. And um, the idea is that the instruction to the, the viewer is, I believe it's see how many times the people in black shirts drop the ball. That video runs for a couple of minutes. And then at the end, there's a screen capture where it says, now look for the gorilla. And if you play the video back, the vast majority of people haven't spotted that there was a gorilla anywhere in this video. They've been busy counting the ball movements. It turns out there's a gorilla that dances around behind all of the players, wiggles in between them, I think waves, and then leaves. Very few people notice it the first time around. The other fun video that is available is uh, a video where two people are doing a card trick. And they lay out a deck of cards on the table. I believe they have red backs to start with. The person asks the participant to pick a card. They do so. The, uh, the number of the card is shown to the camera. They put it back in the deck. Then what happens is a trick is done, and the backing of the deck changes color to blue. But what, again, what no one else has noticed is that the two people have both changed their clothes. The backing of the set color has changed. And I think even uh, one of the sofas or something changed color as well. I think yeah, they put and the tablecloth, I think, does also. I think also. so, yeah. Mm. Yeah, but again, it's, it, it's, again, it's all about your selective attention. So yeah. because your attention is cued to a given stimulus because you've been given an instruction, you deem that stimulus to be very salient because you're told it is. Yeah. So you focus on that. And because your spotlight of attention is so laser, sh laser sharp, yeah. you don't see what's going on in the world around you necessarily. Yeah. And yeah. again, it just shows you how focused our attention can be. But also, perhaps how easy it is to have, as we say, see something staring you in the face but not notice it because attention and perception can be decoupled. So even though we see the world around us, we're not paying full attention, we're not perceiving all of the richness that's around us because we can't. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Chris. That's been really, really interesting. And if you're interested, uh, it's Simon and Levens, who are the two key researchers in those areas, so you can always have a Google and see what's there. Um, Jason and Sultana, how did people get on with spotting some of our changes? Yeah, we've yeah. got some changes uh, people have noticed. Um, Davin, has, uh, Davin Davies has understood that the atoms have moved on the sofa mm -hmm. next to Chris. So that was one sharp-eyed viewer there. Yeah. And um, the rhino's moved as well. A few people have guessed that one. Um, a few people were asking if the skull was there. Yeah. It was. That one didn't move. No, that one no. didn't move. <laughs> but it's salient, though, because we're talking about the brain. So. Yeah. Yep. Um, Oh, there's a, someone said, Joanne Lewis said there's a um, screen has text to as well on it. So, but I think that was already on there, wasn't there? The screen did change, actually. Right when so. we cut back to camera, it did change. <laughs> yeah. so that was a good spot. But yeah. the numbers have stopped moving. The so, numbers yeah. have stopped. very good. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Uh, yes. Lovely. Um, and I've changed my clipboard for a different colour. Oh, yeah, no um, one mentioned that. <laughs> yeah. And no we've got some that. drill bits as well. So uh, yep. we've got the drill bits here oh, yeah. also. Oh, yes. But yeah. well done, very impressive, mm -hmm. especially considering there is so much here. So, um, so that's great. And again, the difference, I guess, between priming people, mm -hmm. um, which we did, whereas sometimes they don't prime people Absolutely. and there will be an experiment that will run without telling people yes. um, what to do. Again, very ethical um, in terms of what what we might do in terms of uh, how we set that up, etc. But uh, Chris, that's been amazing. Some real insight there and, and a brilliant project.
Thank you. Happy to be here, thanks. Great. So we now have um, a short video um, and then we're going to take a look at the Open STEM Labs. Nick Braithwaite will be here um, showing us some of the remote experiments that uh, STEM students can do. Um, but before that, we have a short video and I'll be back live with Nick in about five minutes. I'll see you then.